Welcome back, everybody. This is Chapter 3 of the Wrought Iron Sand My Chef Knife Build. Thanks for staying with me so far. This ought to be a good chapter. We are going to do the handle fabrication and get it glued up, etch the blade, all kinds of great stuff. And uh, without further ado, let's get right into it. Now that we've got our block rough sized, I'm going to take it over here and uh, locate it within the parameters of the handle pattern. I'll locate the pattern on the block, whatever you like to, however you like to say it. I am going to have to cut the face angle of this block back a little bit to match the face angle of the handle that we have drawn. So I've marked where the bottom and the top of the handle end. And then I'll trace around it from there. Every time you trace a pattern, we trace this pattern off of another pattern. Now we're tracing this pattern onto the wood. It gets a little bit bigger. Not by much if you're using a fine pencil, but it's something to consider. In this case, I don't mind it because it's every time it gives us a little bit extra material to work with rather than creating an error that's not in our favor. So that's good to go. Take a straight edge and mark across these two front marks that I made to match the angle of the back of the trim cap. Boom. Now I'm going to saw this first real quick and then we'll grind it later. Now we're just cleaning off the saw cuts with a 36 grit um, aluminum oxide belt. You need to make sure that the sides stay 90 degree to the faces of the handle, so I'm just coming up in a loose grip, allowing it to index to the actual saw cut, which was 90 degrees, and go from there. And now, with the handle trimmed roughly to size, take the handle with the trim cap installed, and we are going to trace the tang. Onto the handle block. This gives us, I mean we could have used the pattern to trace the tang on here, but this gives us an actual true to the tang that we have without any stacked errors representation of where we need to drill our hole. So we're good, we got profile, we got parallel sides, we got our max thickness, and then we got our tang marked on where we need to put our slot for our handle. All right, now we're gonna drill the handle out. So I am gonna start with an end mill and then I don't like to hold an end mill in a drill chuck, so we're going to hold it in a collet. This is a Quick Switch 30 to Acura Flex 50 series collet chuck. I just got these little bad boys in the mail today. A couple of collets, I got some more on the way too. This is a 3 sixteenths Acura Flex collet. It's going to go in there. We're going to load the pointer up first, 3 16 shank pointer, snug that a little bit real quick, throw that in the spindle, and lock the holder, then let's get these out of the way, Dial the table on over. We're going to scribe a center line on this.
like so. Cool. And then we're going to take the actual marked tang, face that out toward us. And we'll set that down in the vise. Good and far. Now, get some more light on the situation. We'll dial out in front of the block. Run our pointer down in front of the block. And then crank up as close to our block as we can get with the pointer. Now we can see whether the block is, in fact, lined up with the spindle so that we can drill those holes where the edges of the tang are right down in there how we want them. And that is good. Tang has pretty parallel sides. So we don't need to worry about too much taper from end to front of the tang. Now that we've got the block located this way, I'm gonna come on up. And I'm gonna dial over, get as close as I can to the top of the block. We're gonna make sure that we're on our center line there that we scribed. That's good. Let's get the spindle rotating. I add this little extra step because sometimes it's easier to see where the actual point of the pointer is with the spindle rotating. It cuts out some optical error. And we're good there. Now I'm going to lock the table in the Y axis. And uh, we're going to install a 3 16 end, end mill here in the AccuraFlex call it chuck. I do like plunge cutting, i.e. drilling with center cutting end mills, especially since the surface of this block here isn't parallel to the bed of the mill or perpendicular to the axis of the spindle, a drill would really wander. So I'm just going to plunge cut this hole to the full depth of the end mill here. And then just do a row of those. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and make a quick transfer here. A lot of the time, I'll remember and do this ahead of the time ahead of time over at the layout table. But it works right now too. Just set the calipers to where the line of the tang comes out on the side of the block. And scribe over here. That way we have the location of the top and the bottom of the tang here. And I just put some pencil on that scribe line too. Cool. All right, so now we're just gonna plunge cut at that. I'm gonna reset the quill handle here to where I get a range of travel that's not awkward. And let's see how this Amboina drills. I would say that drills quite nicely. It's not really gumming up the bit. Okay. Now I can do this a couple of different ways. Uh, this time, let me show you what I'm going to do. Now you can do this with tape too. I'm going to set a drill collar, stop collar here though. Let me grab the knife. You can set it off of a drawing, you can take a measurement, you can set it to the knife. In this case, I'm just gonna set it 
to the actual knife, give it a little bit extra so we don't have extra work cleaning up the bottom of our hole. And I'm just gonna set that drill collar right there at the full tang length from the knife. Now we're gonna have to rapid this table down some Take this here and mill out. Hopefully. Yeah. Funny thing about collets. There we go. Put this up in there. until we get the clearance to do so. Yeah, and then we'll lock that up in there. Okay, and then we'll follow this with the drill all the way to the full depth of the tank. one of probably three holes that we're gonna drill in this web uh, accurately full depth. So it may take a little bit of extra time that you're not used to as far as swapping bits back and forth from an end mill to a Twist drill and so forth. But I I find that for me it's more than made up for in terms of just having a a good accurate straight tang hole or slot to work with later that I don't have to fool around very much to get the knife to fit. Okay, now we'll just do the one on the far side. That's the full depth of the end mill there. Swap it out for the bit again. You can do this in a keyless drill chuck uh, rather than collets, and it usually will come out halfway decent if you have a relatively precision drill chuck without too much run out. But I'm kind of like a, uh, a principled guy, I guess, with machining and uh, so I tend to hold in mills and collets whenever possible. So now we'll just chase that hole with the twist, twist drill to full depth. There we go. And Bob's your uncle. You can see it goes pretty quick. One more bit swap. i be careful not to burn myself on this dang bit. They always get hot drilling well below where the feet's in. Okay. There.
Now on this one, I'm gonna set the end mill fairly far out of the collet here. So I can plunge cut this one decently deep because I need it to be a good guide. Come over, try to split the difference exactly between these other two holes here. Anyone that's ever done this before with just a twist drill especially will know that the bit's always going to want to pop over into a hole that always exists, even if you're just riding the edge of it. And that's actually why I do the two outer ones first, so it, and then try to ride the line between so it kind of equally wants to deflect both ways at the start. I'm gonna make a little micarta knockout block for this. Okay. So this is the last one that we got to follow with the twist drill here. And that's good because that scorching twist drill is starting to get on my nerves. It probably needs a little sharpen. but it should generate somewhat less heat now running between two already drilled holes as well. So we're just gonna baby it at the start, make sure that we're getting a good guide from this and not, and not push it down in hard so it wants to pop over and take any path of less resistance here. And we're good there. Now, Go back to the end mill one more time here. We'll just route the top up out as deep as we can get it with the end mill. A little bit at a time, you don't want to put too much side pressure on a little end mill, especially when it's run out quite a lot from the chuck and just make sure that we don't shove it sideways and break it or anything we'll just take a few passes and get as deep as we can routing it out and that's all the mill work this bad boy out of here I'm gonna just go over to the drill press and scumble the rest out real quick with this bit so I'm gonna go down one side of the hole first to the full depth and just kind of keep smacking the swarf out I want to clear all the swarf out of the holes before I start scumbling everything out because we don't want that drill bit really jammed up when we're wanting the corners of it to cut. So we got the sides of it cleared up there. We're going to go down the middle hole, clear that up, smack all the dust out. Now we're going to go down in until we can start feeling the tops of the webs in between the holes. That would be um, the bottom of where the end mill is able to clean up to is the start of where those webs begin now. And we're just going to put a little sideways pressure near the top of each web, enough to where we can feel the bit cutting and then pop over, and just remove the top of each little web between the holes a bit at a time, just kind of nibble away at it. We don't want to press so hard that we bend our drill bit or, or really force anything to happen. As long as our holes are close enough together and our wood isn't incredibly obdurate stuff like maybe African blackwood, um, this tends to work quite well. We're not even having to clear our bit out very much. And this um, really shouldn't take too awful much time to finish the hole up like this, provided our um, three holes have been drilled straight and we've gotten down in there pretty far with the end mill to begin with. 
we smack it out every now and then, of course, and just keep going until we are all the way bottomed out. And here's where we'll see um, the last, the last little like eighth inch of the hole is the hardest to clear out, just because of the shape of the drill point. And that's why I usually drill about an eighth inch farther than the um, maximum tang length, just so. If the very, very bottom of the hole isn't perfectly cleaned out, it doesn't interfere with the fit of the end of the tang anyway. But uh, this one here just didn't present us any problems. We got full depth in about that, less than a minute of scumbling it, so no problem there. Now with that routed out, we shouldn't even really have to broach this out too much since this is 3 16 and this is sub 1 8 the edges of the square corners of this tang should catch inside the uh, radiuses here and locate it pretty well let's see not very much wiggle by the time you get up to the trim piece so that is nice and straight too Siding down it, you can see that the blade is centered up on the handle. Yeah. And it's just being indexed nicely with the knife. So that's cool. We got just a couple little like fitment areas to true up, a little gap there. That's cool. We'll just hand sand the front of this down a little bit on a flat plate until this is a good clean fit. Then uh, we'll do some other stuff like contour the handle and drill it for a locating pin and things like that. But uh, we're, we're coming right along here. So pretty soon we're going to drill this for a location pin. But um, before we do that, we want to make sure that this is a good fit to this without any gaps. So. What I like to do is I'll hold it up to one of the ceiling lights and look for where there's light coming through the fit. In this case, it's a little tighter at the bottom than it is at the top. It's a little tighter on the right side than it is on the left side. So when we sand it, we want to put pressure on the bottom and on the right side. So I have those be the trailing edges. I grip it as low on the block as I can and then just apply pressure to that side while I drag it across the block. There's none of this kind of stuff. You're going to get not a flat surface at all from that. You don't want it rocking on there. You just want no chatter and good flat down pressure with maybe a little biased pressure toward whatever side you want to remove a little material from. Looks like a little bit more. Try that. Let's have a look at it with some light. That's actually good. So, we're to the point where we can drill a pin here. First, I gotta mark where that's gonna be. Needs to be about halfway up the handle. I'm going to put it right above the um, bump here in the grip. So that'll look good. And then it's not so close up here that it's in, near any weak point near the tang shoulders. It's going to be reinforced a little bit by the front of the handle by the time you get back here. Then, uh, let's see, I'm just going to use this scribe really to put a quick dimple in there. That ought to do it. Now I'm going to take the block off and drill the block first. And again, this is a good point about having parallel sides on your block. You can put this flat on the drill press table, and as long as your drill press um, quill is square to the table, it's going to drill a nice perpendicular hole through here. So we'll do that. And it's going to be for a 332nd stainless pin stock.
pin stock fits just a little bit tight so we're just going to very quickly on the slack belt section here dust the surface off and we chamfered the end so that it leads into the hole easily and a little bit more this little 1x42 grinder is super handy they have just on the bench for a little deburring or small um, sizing tasks and stuff like that. Working with corbies and pins and fasteners. It's a nice companion for the porta band right next to it. Just for doing work on small parts. Pin stock is often slightly oversized. Either that or else it's like right on size, which also makes it a little bit too big to fit through a uh, right on size hole. The other thing though, that you gotta be careful of, is the pin stock will heat up sometimes grind it too aggressively and then it'll start fitting the hole even worse because it it um it grows a little bit when it heats by a few thousands ah uh, see there we're good so now we'll just locate the uh drill the tank but first we got to make sure it's soft On a lot of knives, I would be doing this with the oxyacetylene torch, but the tang on this one is thin enough that um, I'd be able to get a blue temper pretty quick with this propane plumbing torch here. I'm just going to go for a dark blue temper and then beyond that all the way up the tang. I want to roll the tang around a lot so I'm heating it evenly from both sides so I don't induce any warpage by asymmetrical heating. And this is a good step anyway to toughen up the tang. Not that it needs it, the tang is sand mai too so it's it's jacketed in wrought iron. All the same though, this will make the core tougher. But we do want the core here, which will have hardened all the way up into the tang when we quench this. We do want it to be drillable and, and not to uh, work harden and squeak our bit when we're trying to drill it. So that ought to be plenty good right there. We'll just let that air cool down to room temp and then we will drill it. Now here's something I always have a little fun with. I have a foot pedal rigged all the way down on the floor so that I can actually advance the quill on this with foot pressure if I want to. So let me just get the um, trim cap here and put that on the knife. Try not to bump the camera. Oh, did, I did bump it. Dang me. Okay, we're going to put that on there. Make sure that's up tight where we want it. Yeah, that looks good. 
and we'll make sure the handle fit is still good. Yep. Now, the cool thing is this allows me to hold two parts indexed with pressure on them. And, uh, and actually run the drill down into the hole to mark the tang hands free so I can clamp it with my hands. Just like that. And the idea is not to drill all the way through. That can be problematic, especially if we did hit a hard spot, then we'd have to re-anneal. Re but we put enough pressure to we, we have a very good location for finishing drilling our hole. So we're gonna do that. So you can see I, I reamed it just a little bit there to make the pin fit easy. And now we'll swap in a little countersink and just take the edge off the hole on both sides again to help the pin lead in there easier. And to counteract any uh, kind of stress riser effect sometimes that a sharp burr on a hole can have. Uh, so now we ought to have a pin hole that fits well. Now where did I set that dang pin stock? So moment of truth here. Well, fits through easy. And uh, it's holding everything good and tight. Just barely enough room for glue in there, really. So that's gonna be good. Now I just gotta trim the pin to length. I'll trim it over on the porta band real quick and then uh, debar it and then we'll, we'll have a pin. Okay, let's put that pin in there. Boom. Cool. Now, we'd be able to glue that up now if we wanted to and finish shape the handle. But obviously the blade needs that final finish pulled on it and then it needs etched to bring out the sand mai. And I'm also gonna have to do a trademark etch up here. Put the torch logo on it. Eh, probably actually right there. Uh, I wanna put it on a clean spot in the rot so it etches nice. So once the blade has been finish etched and trademarked, then it'll be ready for glue up. Um, we'll, we'll wrap the blade in tape and towel, oil it well, glue it up, and then we'll just shape and finish out the handle with it attached to the blade. Makes sense for this build. Here I'm etching my trademark. I've got a stencil by Electromark. Uh, taped on there and I only tape it on one side so that it doesn't bunch up um, Etching creates heat and that'll cause your stencil to expand a little bit And if you have it taped on multiple sides, sometimes that'll bunch it up and cause a blurry etch I'm also using electrolyte from Electromark Here's how it came out as etched and Then here it is with a little bit of a sand cleanup. It's difficult to get a super crisp etch on rot now here we are over in the, this is a gator piss straight out of the jug. It's a little bit aged, so it's kind of weak. And I'm using just a fish tank bubbler there to aerate it and kind of keep the etchant stirred and even the results. And then I didn't really like how that had looked, so I decided to give it a secondary etch with coffee. Um, I use Windex to neutralize after the ferric or gator piss little 2000 grit scrub here with rhino wet and then right into the coffee and then this coffee is just regular old great value um, since this isn't like high-end mosaic damascus and i'm just getting some like localized blackening i went with 
what I had on hand rather than running 13 miles to the store for some Nescafe. And ultimately I didn't like how that worked out either. So here's the results of mixing up a fresh batch of ferric chloride from anhydrous powder at a 4 to 1 ratio. Good and strong and hot. Just gave it a few flash etches and that gave me the most dramatic results that I was able to achieve with this particular San Mai. I think I had four tries at etching this and I had to clean it off with 600 uh, grit once in between and kind of strip off the old results. Um, and this stuff is just a little finicky to etch but I like the way this turned out. On the mark side there's a little bit of light spot in the core toward the tip. Uh, just them's the brakes on this one but I think it still looks pretty good. And uh, with that we are ready to move to the next step. Figured I'd go ahead and show my glue up process on this one. I might speed bits up a little bit depending on if it gets redundant but uh, here I am with 220 grit, grit Rhino Wet giving the tang a fresh abrasive scrub. Um, glue tends to bond best when it's just been abraded. It's better than even you know freshly cleaned with acetone. Freshly abraded is absolutely the best bond you can get. So I'm just making sure all of the schmutz from working on it, handling it and stuff is scrubbed off right now and I'm just using that flexible um, sanding backer made out of like Baylor belt with that paper wrapped around it. I keep acetone and a little um, an old bottle from contact lens solution solution it's got a nice squeezy top so you can kind of meter your dose. There's a paper towel here and I'm just rinsing off um, the like first kind of run of gross dust that's been sanded off. Oily dust you can see it came off black and then I'm gonna go ahead and hit the tang up again and scrub over the um, freshly rinsed tang there. Just kind of gets me like a double clean on it and that helps. So here I'm using 30 minutes slow cure epoxy, Bob Smith Industries. I get this from TrueGrit.com. Other places carry it. This is a good strong epoxy with the slower cure and it's um kind of one of the industry standard epoxies used by knife makers. Some people use G-Flex, some people use Bob Smith, um, some people use like 3M stuff, but uh, this is good strong epoxy here. Made sure to get equal amounts there. And then I like to just mix the living heck out of it and keep scraping the edges of the puddle in. That way I don't get any kind of unmixed bits around the edges. Epoxy doesn't um, develop nearly the strength or work nearly as well. Even if it seems like it does, it'll be weaker if you don't mix it up good and thoroughly. So after about a solid minute, minute and a half of mixing that epoxy until it just looked kind of uniformly um, whitish colored. Now I'm not going to coat the whole tang yet. I just put a little bit on the front near the, um, the handle cap area and make sure to get the back of the shoulders there. And then uh, apply epoxy to the inside of the slot, the front where the shoulders will sit. And just make sure to get everywhere on that guard that will need to have an epoxy joint. And we'll just slide it up there and then seat it tight. Make sure that vertically it's sitting right where it wants to, made up best against the shoulders. 
Make sure there's no dry spots on the actual junction between the G10 and the metal. Now I'm going to fill up the back of the slot a little bit, paint the entire back of that trim cap. And then, uh, yeah, you can see the epoxy is running pretty slow. Usually a 30-minute epoxy will run faster than that. But I don't know if I mentioned it before in this video, but we are having a cold snap here um, in Tenasket. On the, on the 13th, I think, when this was filmed, it got down to like, like 14 below probably at my house here. And uh, it was just a kind of a brutal winter week. Uh, and then with the wind blowing, too, the wind chill was gosh probably like 30 below or something so it just kind of makes the build more challenging the shop is cold I have to do sanding uh, indoors and epoxy work indoors etching definitely indoors I etch indoors all winter because um, your etchant baths just just don't work if they're cold even indoors it the etchant will be like 5 to 10 degrees cooler than it normally is um, during the warm part of the year, so that can really kind of screw with your etch times and etch results even sometimes. I, I think that's part of why I had some difficulty etching the blade. But it is what it is. We, we endeavor to persevere. Now we got that whole handle filled up nicely, and we kind of buttered down in there with the craft stick and made, made sure that it was all adhered to the inside edges of the hole in the handle. We're just going to scrape a nice thin layer of the entire tang here. There should be no areas of the entire glue joint all the way down into the handle that are left unwetted. So we, we can't have any like dry air bubbles form on the sur surfaces of anything that needs to be bonded. A little bit of cleanup here. I like to use Q-tips for this. They just work well for um, no fuss, kind of like spot glue removal. I'm going to push that handle all the way forward till the glue pooches out and then shove the pin through there. Uh, and we won't even need to clamp this because we got a good dry fit and the pin holds all of the pieces from being able to back off the tang at all. Um, so I feel, I feel good knowing, even though it's hard to see under the epoxy in places, I feel good knowing that it fit up dry so well that there was barely any room for glue. Now I can just wipe off the excess, get a little bit better of a look, make sure we're good, and then uh, just do the little, the little cleanup and maintenance around the edge, starting with a bunch of Q-tips, just dry for like the gross epoxy removal and then running through a bunch of q-tips with a little bit of acetone on them for the finish epoxy removal you don't want to leave like epoxy washes you know on the blade that are hard to remove later when you finally notice them when they're cured you just need to make sure and go over them with a light acetone and I just dampen the q-tips with acetone or a paper towel if I'm using it you don't want acetone kind of squeezing out and wicking all over the joint because it will actually erode the epoxy um, from inside the joint where you really need it to remain so just damp with acetone and then uh, we should be able to just let this set you know this is a slow cure epoxy so it'll take a while for I mean the pot life is pretty long on this stuff so the glue will stay wet and you really need to babysit this slow cure stuff because you'll get everything wiped down and you'll think it's good and then you'll come back next day if you don't watch out and you'll see where more epoxy kind of um, squeezed out of the joint and wicked out onto the blade or something when you weren't paying attention so you need to you need to check it a few times while the glue is curing and make sure to do any kind of maintenance cleanup on the epoxy if more kind of spooges out onto the blade while it's curing uh, because it can be a real pain to remove later without scuffing your blade sometimes and with that, I think we're going to leave it. We're going to sit this knife down, let the glue cure. And um, at uh, about 45 minutes here, we've got a long enough video length 
Next chapter, we're going to finish the knife. We're going to be handle shaping, finish sanding, all that kind of stuff. Thanks so much, everyone, for staying on this build with me, and uh, please continue to tune in. See you next time.